Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here among you. Um, it's uh, about seven months that uh, Bito and I have come to uh, Los Angeles area, and uh, we come from Minnesota, and you are all familiar with the weather in Minnesota, so sort of paradise here in terms of climate. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I want particularly to thank uh, Assembly of Santa Monica for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity and this uh, privilege to, to be with you and to share with you some of the issues related to, to the faith. The overall topic of the discussions that we are going to have in, during the 12 sessions probably that we would have assuming that during the fast also we would have sessions. Um, is something in general about Baha'i texts and their context and the interaction of the text and, and context. So the formal topic is text and context in Baha'i heroic age. So what I'm going to do today as sort of introduction is to uh, explain a little bit what I mean by these words and the significance uh, in general of the general topic. And if we had time, then I begin some discussion of the writings of the Bab. Uh, I don't have at this moment a very clear uh, plan for the 12 sessions. But most likely we are going to discuss uh, a few sessions about the writings of the Bab, a few sessions about the writings of Baha'u'llah, a few sessions about the writings of Abdul Baha, and all of that in the context of uh, history of the time, history of the life of the central figures of the faith and the like. Uh, but uh, now about this whole uh, title, text and context, heroic age and so on, I want to talk about this a little bit as introduction. This introduction might take the whole session today uh, or, uh, uh, or just serve as an introduction to more substantive discussion about the writings of the Bob to begin with. Uh, why I'm saying text and context? Um, uh, uh, the basic uh, um, philosophical theological assumption of the Baha'i faith, which to a large extent from the very beginning, it distinguishes the Baha'i faith from every other uh, spiritual movement, religion, uh, prior to the Baha'i faith, is the very fact that divine text, spiritual text, is understood as inseparable from its context. Text is understood in terms of context and the interaction of the context, and they are inseparable from each other. This, this dialectic interaction of text and context uh, is fundamental to the, to the Baha'i faith. Now, Baha'i faith begins uh, with a particular event, as you all know. That was May 23rd, 1844. Um, a young... Uh, um, scholar of the Sheikhi school called Mullah Hussein, or whose real name is Mullah Muhammad Hussein. The Bab always calls him Muhammad. Uh, but the person that we know as Mullah Hussein, the Bab never calls him Mullah Hussein. Uh, in all the writings, he is called Muhammad because his first name is Muhammad Hussein. But in any case, uh, this uh, young scholar, uh, Mullah Hussein, meets the Bab in Shiraz, and he's invited to the house of the Bab, and they have conversation and interactions, and through this interaction, of course, the first major work of the Bab after declaration uh, is beginning to be uh, revealed, and that's commentary on the Surah of Joseph, which I'm sure I'll talk about that in one of these sessions. But I want you to pay attention to this uh, historic event. This is the moment of the inception of the Baha'i faith. 
but something is happening here which is very, very important and very crucial, and that is the fact that the beginning of the Baha'i faith, which according to Bob, that night was the beginning of the day of resurrection, the day of judgment. It's a historic night. That day, which becomes the beginning of the calendar, Baha'i calendar, Bobby Baha'i calendar, is not the day in which a new relation emerges between the Bob and God so that the Bob becomes conscious, becomes aware for the first time of having a divine mission. It has nothing to do with the relation of the Bob and God. What defines that particular night is that that night defines a particular relation between God through the Bob and a particular human being, namely Mullah Hussein. <laughs> In the previous uh, dispensations, the conception of the beginning of religion is understood as the moment in which prophetic consciousness emerges for the first time. For example, Prophet Muhammad receives revelation from angel Gabriel. That is the moment that Islam begins, the moment that he becomes conscious and receives for the first time verses from God. God says, read and recite and so on. In the case of the Babi Baha'i faith, it's very interesting that this is not the case. The Bab himself, in various writings of, of the Bab, he very explicitly says that before that night, uh, the prophetic consciousness had taken place. He talks about the first day that divine revelation took place, and he started to write in the form of divine revelation, and he gives the date of that, and that date, of course, is not um, 23rd of May of June 18, 23rd of May of 1844. It, um, that particular one is about 50 days before that. But also he discusses in his writings about other situations in which he became conscious of his uh, mission. So, why the inception of the Bobby Baha'i movement is not the night, for example, that the Bob has a particular dream and he becomes conscious of a divine mission and so he is receiving revelation. That is not the day of resurrection for the Baha'i faith. That is not the beginning of the Bobby Baha'i calendar. The beginning of this new cycle is, on the contrary, a day in which a particular human being becomes ready and therefore a particular dialogue, conversation between the Bob and this human being representing humanity takes place. This is very, very important. It gives us a sense of the meaning of religion and identity of religion. In the past, religion was understood by the followers of those religions as the expression of the absolute will of God. It was a relation between God and the prophet. It had nothing to do with history. It had nothing to do with context. It had nothing to do with humanity. It was a relation between God and the prophet. Namely, it was nothing but expression of arbitrary divine will. There is a divine will based upon divine knowledge and at this moment, religion starts. Because religion was understood in terms of divine will, for that reason it was easy for the members, followers of these religions to assume that their religion is the last religion, is the last revelation. It's a revelation which would never change because the identity of that revelation has nothing to do with society, with humanity, with the stage of development of humanity or things like that. It was just a matter of the divine will. It becomes something absolute and unchangeable. Now, with the event that takes place uh, on that particular night, what happens is that the beginning of religion is defined as the moment 
that a particular interaction between God through the Bab and humanity takes place. It becomes, the religion now becomes a product of the interaction between humanity, society, stage of development of civilization and so on, and the divine will. No longer religion is just expression of divine will. Religion is the product of this dialogue between the divine will and the stage of development, receptivity of the humanity. From this moment, of course, religion, divine will, divine truth, uh, divine laws, and so on, all becomes historically specific. And therefore, the concept of history uh, enters the notion of religion and revelation. Religion is not something outside of history, and for that reason, absolute society can change, history can change, but religion remains the same thing forever and ever, because it's the will of God and the knowledge of God, which is absolute, has nothing to do with history. History is changing, people are changing, but of course, divine knowledge, divine essence, and so on doesn't change. That was the previous conceptions. But now religion, from that very moment in, in which this religion is, uh, 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 is begun, which the, for the Bob is so important that in Persian Bayan, he gives the exact minute of that. You are all familiar with that. So he says two hours and 11 minutes after the sunset. He, he even gives a minute, and he says that the day of resurrection starts at that moment. Now, this is the moment, of course, that humanity also has achieved a particular stage of development. And so the will of God takes different shapes and forms in accordance with this interaction with humanity, history, society, civilization, and so on. From this moment, of course, we have the birth of the doctrine that we call it progressive revelation. The doctrine of progressive revelation means that religion has nothing to do with the unchangeable essence of God or knowledge of God. Religion is reflection of divine essence, a reflection of divine knowledge in history, in world, and of course world and history, they are continuing, they are dynamic, they change, they transform, and so on. And because of this interaction, religion, its uh, spiritual doctrines, its, its social laws, and so on, become something dynamic and has to change. And so religion can be a cause of progress and advancement of humanity, or it can become one of the main forces, obstacles, against development of humanity. It both is possible. The crucial issue is this interaction. So we have a text and context. Text refers to that divine revelation, you know, the books and messages and so on. And context refers to the historical stage, historical conditions. Uh, events in society, whether it is in Iran, in the world, and degree of development of humanity. For the Baha'i faith, the thesis of progressive revelation means this, that text takes particular forms and shapes not on the basis of an arbitrary will of God, but the form of text is defined and content of the text is determined, determined to a large extent by the requirements of the time, by the needs of humanity, by the stage of spiritual development, cultural development of humanity at a particular point of time. Religion is no longer something ahistorical outside of history, but uh, religion is product of the interaction of the sacred and, and the world. It's, it's very important. So, the very fact that we celebrate the night of the, of the declaration of the Bab, uh, you see how, how important it is and what a uh, philosophical, uh, sociological revolution and new meaning and so on is, uh, 
is implicit in, uh, in, in this whole idea. So for understanding the text, we have to look at the context. And this context can be many different things. Some of them are context, immediate context. Some of them are more longer uh, context. Some of them refers to the immediate surrounding of the revelation of the text. Some, some of them global context, and so on. So, uh, but the basic point is that these two are inseparable from each other. So, the general title of these talks is Text and Context uh, in uh, Baha'i Heroic Age. When we say Baha'i Heroic Age, we are giving a sense of Baha'i history. And of course, uh, this idea uh, of heroic age is one of the creations of the uh, guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Afandi. Shoghi Afandi, more than perhaps anything else, he emphasized this uh, historical consciousness. And the, the, the concept of history was so central in the writings of Shoghi Afandi and in anything that he did. Among other things that he did, he, he was very much concerned with writing actual history of the Baha'i faith. God passes by, for instance, is one of them. Or uh, translated, which is not just translation, selection, modification, revision, at, at, as well as translation of the work by Nabil, which is called Dawn Breakers. It's not a simple translation. Um, also in Persian, he has other tablets, Lohe Khan, for instance, the tablet of century. Uh, like God passes by, they celebrate 100 years after that night, after the night that we talked about. So history is very important for Shoghi Effendi, but also he give, creates a philosophy of history. And among these things that he creates is, of course, the definition of Baha'i history in terms of three different ages. And you are all familiar with that. But I want to put that in, in a more theoretical context uh, for this discussion. Guardian made a distinction between three phases of Baha'i history. So Baha'i history is defined in terms of first heroic age, then the formative age, and then the golden age, right? Everybody knows that. But what exactly does this uh, concept mean? And of course, m the talks that you are going to have with each other, discussions we are going to have with each other are going to be text and context in the heroic age. But now it is, it is useful to look at this uh, whole periodization um, in, in, a, in a more theoretical way. Now, in order uh, to do that, I want to uh, go to sociological theory. Um, and uh, that's one of the areas that I'm very interested in my professional life. Um, but it is uh, very useful for uh, understanding lots of things in, uh, in uh, Baha'i literature as well. What I'm going to do is to look at a theory in sociology of religion by perhaps the greatest sociologist who has ever been. His name is Max Weber, a German sociologist. And one of the main theories, ideas that he has presented, he calls it routinization of charisma. And after discussing that, then I come back to this distinction between heroic age and formative age and golden age and so on. Uh, for uh, Max Weber, authority uh, are, is of three different types. There are three different types of authority. And the first type of authority for him is called charismatic authority. He made the word charisma popular. It was Max Weber in his, and his writings are in German. Uh, so whatever I say is translation from German. 
but uh, uh, because he talked about charisma so much, it has become part of vocabulary of all different languages now. In Persian, sometimes uh, they use the word farre as an equivalent of, uh, of that sense of um, <clears throat> charisma. In any case, charismatic authority is that type of authority in which uh, the followers uh, follow the leader because they believe that the leader has extraordinary, perhaps supernatural characteristics and powers. These extraordinary uh, powers, which the followers believe that the charismatic figure has, becomes the basis of obedience, the basis of loyalty. The greatest clear example of charisma, of course, are the prophets. Prophets are always the major, perhaps the pure uh, expressions of charismatic force. Namely, there is tradition in the past, and then the prophet comes, negates all those traditions, says no to, the, to those traditions, and becomes the lawmaker. And his word becomes the basis of a new law. A new way of life has to be followed simply because this charismatic authority is saying so. Charismatic authority is revolutionary because it rejects everything that has been in the past. It rejects tradition. The second type of authority is traditional authority. Traditional authority is a type of authority in which the leader is followed because the leadership of the leader is based upon some traditional rules. For example, if uh, uh, in particularly in, uh, in uh, Western feudal society, if the king dies, then the son of the king becomes the leader. The idea is that there is something unique about the blood, the royal blood. And so the royal blood confers authority. And so it doesn't matter who this person is, what are the characters of this person, and so on. But because of this particular tradition, this uh, defines who is the leader, who, is the, who has the legitimacy and to be, to be followed. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of history of Iran, politically, this has always been uh, non-clear. It's one of the differences between Iran uh, uh, and the West. And for that reason, any time that a leader, a king, has, has died, there has been wars um, and uh, chaos in Iranian history for the question of succession. And the, it has been brute force. The traditional rules have been very vague and unclear. One of the main differences between the um, history of Iran and history of the West. In any case, that is a traditional authority. Um, this tradition can be, uh, can be anything in different ways. And finally, Max Weber distinguishes a third type of authority that he calls it legal rational authority. Legal rational authority is uh, a type of authority in which the followers follow the leader because the rule of this leader is based upon some uh, rationally defined laws which are enacted, legislated in a predictable, formal, rational fashion. The laws are also un are understood as something which is product of legislation by human reason not as some natural, natural thing that is discovered. When it is considered to be natural, that's part of the traditional authority. Uh, legal rational authority has been an exception in the history of humanity, and it's just a recent phenomenon in democratic societies, some sort of legal rational authority is emerging. But uh, in, the, in terms of the history of the, of the world, normally it has not existed. So the basic type of authority has been charismatic authority and traditional authority, usually. Now, this is the definition of authority. 
And religions always begin with the charisma, with the revelation, with the prophetic uh, uh, force. But Max Weber argues that charisma is unstable. Charisma cannot be just automatically transmitted. Charisma, because it's not in the blood, uh, it's a belief in extraordinary characteristics and powers of, of a person, cannot just be imitated or transmitted. The fact that this person is biologically related to the charismatic force, it does not mean that this person would have charisma. Charisma is something which has to be proven. For Maxwell, this is the difference between priest and prophet as well. Priest has authority on the basis of tradition. But prophet has authority on the basis of charisma. Charismatic authority therefore cannot be just inherited or just assigned to somebody else. It is also unstable because charisma not only is opposed to tradition, but it is also opposed to reason. When a charismatic authority, for instance, a religious community emerges, the followers of the new prophet are so in love with that prophet that they live their ordinary life. They try to come and be with him and to have a sort of communal life. It's a, almost a communistic type of style of life. And there is not much emphasis on material rationality or occupational or business economic rationality. For this reason also, charisma is unstable. It cannot continue because society in order to function needs to have routine business, economic, rational, uh, occupational life and so on. And this is in tension with that charismatic authority. So charisma is unstable. And for these reasons and some other reasons that I, we don't have the time to discuss, it's the central thesis of Max Weber which says that charisma and charismatic authority has to become routinized. It has to be transferred and translated into another form of authority. It cannot continue. So charismatic authority becomes routinized. And routinized normally means that it turns into a traditional type of authority. This routinization or traditionalization of charisma uh, is uh, the uh, necessary consequence of, uh, of the world and characteristics of charisma. This was, uh, in a very brief uh, expression of that, Max Weber's conception of religion and religious authority in general, but in particular religious authority and the need for routinization of charisma. I want to refer now to one other sociologist. His name is Thomas Odi, or Odea. I don't know. It's an Irish name. Anybody knows? It's, it's O, then apostrophe, then D-E-A. I never knew Odi. Odi. OK. Thomas Odi, he was a sociologist of religion, and he was himself Catholic, and he he taught in a number of universities. The last university that he taught was the University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, he died in the 1970s sometimes. And he has written a number of classic works in sociology of religion, which are very interesting. One of them is called Just Sociology of Religion. What I want to share with you is a thesis that he has offered in, in uh, this book. Uh, which became very influential, although not that many people are aware of this, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it was a very creative work. He took Max Weber's thesis of routinization of charisma, but then argued what he calls dilemma of institutionalization. What he argued was that the very fact that charisma becomes routinized, and he uses the word now institutionalization of the charisma. 
That routinization or that institutionalization necessarily leads to the death of charisma. Namely, the very fact that charisma has to become routinized, institutionalized, creates a situation which the original values of charisma become destroyed. It's a tragic conception of religion. Religion comes with a charismatic force, representing certain values and motivations and things like that. But in order for religion to continue to have some impact in the world, it has to become institutionalized. It has to become routinized. Otherwise, charisma is gone and the religion is forgotten. But the very fact of routinization, the very fact of institutionalization, means that those original values of charisma are going to be destroyed and the opposite of those things becomes reality in the world. So it's a, it's a situation that there is no solution for that. Either religion has to stay at the level of that charismatic authority and then die away and would have no impact in the society and nobody would know about it, or it becomes part of society, become routinized, become institutionalized, but by mere institutionalization, what would become real is the exact opposite of those goals and aims of charismatic authority and its values and so on. He talks of five antinomies of these dilemmas, five dilemmas, or antinomies. And they are very useful. The most important dilemma, he doesn't talk about it. The most important dilemma is the dilemma of succession. In the history of religions, for routinization, for the survival of religion, it is necessary that after the prophet, somebody would succeed and become the leader of the, of the movement. But what has happened so far is that that very succession, which is part of that routinization, institutionalization of religion, has led to divisions, hatred, conflict, disunity within the religious community, turning religious community, which was created initially for the sake of love and solidarity and things like that in the community to become enemies of each other, objectify each other, and turn against each other. You see that, for instance, in Islam, it comes to create a conception of a united community with certain values. The most important values become the value of the unity of God reflected in this ummah, in this community. But immediately, the problem of succession of the Prophet Muhammad passes away, creates the conflict between Shia and Sunnis. That's the beginning. And then there are thousands of other conflicts and so on, which um, <clears throat> makes the community uh, disunited and antagonistic, hateful, which continues even to our time. It's really tragic what we see uh, in different parts of the Islamic world that the major elements of contention, of hatred and conflict and so on many times are just these divisions among uh, different is Islamic groups. All going back to this question of succession. Uh, as I mentioned, Odi does not talk about this for varieties of reasons. I, I think his, his research was only about particular sex and therefore he couldn't see the overall picture. But he talks about other types of uh, uh, antinomies as well. Uh, for example, one antinomy, one dilemma that he talks about is related to organization. The charisma, in order to survive and in order to have impact in the society, must be followed the, through this institutionalization by emergence of particular religious organizations. These organizations make possible that religion would have influence and can, can have more power and reach its goals and have impact in the world and so on. However, 
the very fact of emergence of the conversion of the charisma into these organizations creates a bureaucratic orientation, separates the believers from the leadership, alienates them from that leadership, and therefore organizations become ends in themselves, in a sense. And the whole original values of the religion is destroyed because of this bureaucratic orientation and the uh, resulting consequent um, alienation of individuals from the uh, values of the community. Or he talks about, for instance, conversion versus coercion. This is the antinomy related to the fact that at the time of charisma, if a person joins and becomes member of that religious community, it's because this person converts. Namely, the whole being of this person becomes convinced of the truth of this charismatic force, accepts that, uh, and uh, many times because uh, uh, even because of lots of dangers and uh, lots of economic loss and things like that. But as time goes on and religion is institutionalized, is routinized, usually religion becomes associated with the state as well. So instead of that, the basis of joining the membership of the community becomes based upon coercion in varieties of ways. It's no longer a voluntary choice. And particularly, state makes it, creates laws and pressures and so on that you are going to be punished if you don't. You see again that that original values are becoming the exact opposite, are destroyed. It's a very tragic thing. Another dilemma that he talks about is replacement of uh, spirit by the letter. This means that in the beginning, in the charismatic stage and so on, particular spiritual values are uh, the concerns. They, they are the, the main ideas. As time goes on, goes on through this routinization and institutionalization, secondary aspects of religion, which are just vehicles for those spiritual values, become the primary issues. And the community becomes obsessed with these secondary token expressions of religion, forgets about the spirit of religion, all those values are lost, and a, a dogmatic um, uh, community emerges who is obsessed with particular rituals, with particular secondary laws and things like that. So the, the root and principles um, in Baha'i terminology, the asl uh, is forgotten and the secondary tokens, uh, derivatives, uh, far, uh, replaces that. He talks about also, and this is the last one I say, uh, about changing of roles and motivations. In the beginning, people within the charismatic structure, they do different things because of a particular motivation, namely the belief, devotion, to the, to the cause, to the spiritual values, to the charismatic figure. As time goes on, because of this routinization and institutionalizations, new roles and new interests are created. People have now particular economic, social, political interest that is created within these religious communities. And therefore, from now on, the motivation for different types of activities of the believers become increasingly this material, uh, social, instrumental motivations because of the roles that they have. Their power, their wealth, and so on, now is dependent on these things, and they do things not because of spiritual values or commitment to values and so on, but because of this um, new material, unspiritual, anti-spiritual reasons, roles, motives, and, and the like. So 
Max Weber talked about the necessity of conversion of charisma into uh, a traditional type of authority or routinization, but uh, Odi noticed something uh, even uh, more important, namely the tragic character of this routinization, the tragic character of this institutionalization. And now it gives us a sense of history. History of religion becomes really a very disappointing history. Namely, religion emerges to express particular values, but by its very process of routinization, it creates the opposite values, destroys those spiritual values, and replaces that with opposites. It's a very unhappy, very sad story, isn't that? <laughs> and what he says uh, makes sense, unfortunately, very significantly in terms of history of religions. This very pessimistic outlook about the history of religion is uh, the ultimate theoretical structure, conception of history, model of history, of, uh, of religion and religiosity up to now. It is in this context that now I want you to pay attention to the conception of Baha'i history in the writings of Shoghi Effendi. Shoghi Effendi talks of the same thing, heroic age, which he calls it uh, apostolic age as well, it's the age of apostles and it's, it's the age of heroes. It is the age of charismatic authority. It's the same thing. The, even the wording is, is the same, really. So the Baha'i faith begins with, uh, with that charismatic authority, the heroic age, the apostolic age. And of course, for him, this consists of the Bab, of Baha'u'llah, and Abdul Baha. And truly, all the three were charismatic forces without any doubt. Anybody who has met them, who had any interaction with them, <laughs> enemy uh, or friend, they all have testified to this presence of this, of this energy, of this extraordinary power. Every, everybody has testified to that. So this is the emergence of charisma, heroic age is a new set of values and ideas emerge in the world. And of course, the emergence of this new set of ideas and values are associated with a lot of sacrifice, with a lot of blood, uh, a lot of oppression. That's why he calls, he calls it heroic age as well. But then it is very interesting that Shoghi Afandi has this absolutely optimistic idea about the history of the Baha'i faith. Instead of these antinomies of routinization and destruction of the charisma and the values of that through the process of institutionalization, he talks about this process of institutionalization in terms of two stages of first the formative age and then the golden age. The basic idea of the golden age is the very idea that those values associated and conceived and brought um, through the heroic age are going to be realized, institutionalized, crystallized as part of culture, socioeconomic order, socioeconomic relations, and so on in society. Golden age means not destruction of the original charismatic principles and values, but the very realization of them, institutionalization of them, materialization of those values in the world, in the society. And the mediating point, of course, he calls it the formative age. This is the mediating stage that particular institutions are created, which are supposed to be agents of creation of a type of new order, which becomes the realization of those values, charismatic values and so on, in the golden age. 
what it means is that in terms of the theories of Max Weber and OD, for this to happen, it is necessary that many of those uh, problems which necessarily led to the destruction of those original values of the charisma which Thomas Odi mentioned, they should be, uh, there should be measures to prevent uh, those problems emerging in the Baha'i community in, and in the society associated with the, the, the future civilization. The first one, of course, which Odi didn't mention, and, and for me is perhaps the most important, is the succession. And of course, that you are all familiar with, um, that has been taken care of in, the, in this revelation. And so uh, it doesn't mean that there won't be challenges. There has been challenges against the leadership of the Baha'i faith and its unity. And so there has been, as long as humans exist, there would always be challenges. But these challenges have not succeeded in creating uh, fundamental divisions and always vast, vast majority of the Baha'is have been loyal to um, the, the way that textually and explicitly or in Baha'i language uh, in terms of uh, covenant, uh, the succession has been identified and, and defined. So, uh, <clears throat> I may talk about the concept of covenant in one of these other sessions, but if I do that, of course, it won't be normal discussions of covenant, but a more philosophical, theological discussion of what this philosophical underpinning of this concept of covenant is. It's, it's a much more uh, philosophically complex concept than what we normally associate it with. But the other antinomies are also very important. One major difference here, which is defined by Shori Afandi's concept of formative age, is a new principle that the process of institutionalization in the Baha'i faith means democratization. In, in a set of charisma turning into a traditional authority, charisma turns into some sort of legal rational authority, as Max Weber mentioned that. But this democratization, this legal rational authority emerging is not even Max Weber's concept of legal rational authority. It's a very different conception of it. It's not the notion of democracy that we normally understand it uh, in, uh, in everyday discourse. But the basic idea is that Baha'u'llah came up with this idea that all human beings are expressions of God. They are mirrors of God. All reality is mirror of God. That is the fundamental theological, philosophical principle of the Baha'i faith. And because of that fundamental basis, all human beings have the, this inherent intrinsic rights and sacredness and beauty. And because of all these things, for Baha'u'llah, the only legitimate form of decision making is democratic, consultative decision making. The concept of democracy, consultation, and so on is fundamental in the Baha'i writings, fundamental. And in one of the future sessions, I, I may address that particular issue. But it's not just a political theory. It is based upon this theological, metaphysical worldview of Baha'u'llah. That's why he emphasizes usually the concept of consultation. When he's talking about, for example, the uh, political system in England, he talks of a system of consultation by the people. That's the way he defines the word democracy. And consultation for Baha'u'llah, of course, means much more than having equal vote and having a parliament and having a lot of infightings for making policies. Consultation is a completely a spiritual process, totally different from whatever in the name of democracy has existed so far. It's a new conception of, of, of these things. 
And for the Baha'i communities also, we have to learn the concept of consultation. These are not something that has emerged. They have to emerge. Baha'i faith is a young spiritual movement, and the Baha'i ideas and values and so on gradually has been learned and, and implemented. But the very fact that leadership of the Baha'i community and decision making and the administrative order which is created, this routinization of the charisma does not become a traditional authority, but it becomes a democratic, legal, rational authority based upon the belief in the sacredness of all human beings and, and intrinsic beauty of all human beings has to play a very important role in this optimistic account, optimistic vision of Shoghi Afandi. Because that golden age is really another expression of that same principle, of that same principle of consultation, that same principle of equality and human rights and solidarity and unity and so on, which becomes a fundamental principle of this new administrative order, which wants to create a community and also wants to have interaction with the uh, outside world. But for this, of course, to happen, we as Baha'i communities have very uh, historical missions and responsibilities. For this to happen, so that the pessimistic views of Thomas Odi is not realized in terms of Baha'i history and Baha'i community, all of, the, all of us and all the people associated with the Baha'i faith have particular responsibilities to, to have particular awareness, particular uh, spiritual journeys, developments, dynamics, and so on, to make sure that this would happen. We have, for example, a democratic set of institutions. But it is very easy that we turn that into a bureaucratic set of institutions, become alienated from these bureaucratic institutions, become, they become a ritualized things. We develop a sense that the same thing happens regardless of whatever, the same people would be elected regardless of whatever, and then we think that we are not important, then we think that it's not democracy, it's not, it, it, it has nothing to do with individuals, and then increasingly become disenchanted that emulated from that, and sometimes I see some elements of this in the Baha'i community. So it is nothing automatic to happen. It would happen, the vision of Shoghi Afandi, if we as Baha'i community, all of us together, think and act and feel uh, in particular ways that it is discussed in the Baha'i writings. A structure has been created, this administrative order, this democratic structure, which provides uh, that opportunity. The rest of that is your responsibility and my responsibility and the responsibility of the Baha'i communities. It's not an automatic will of God to happen. You remember I began with text and context. Even this statement that, um, that uh, because of the Quranic tradition in the Baha'i writings is frequently repeated, yaf'alu ma yasha wa yahkumu ma yuri, that God uh, does whatever he wills and, uh, um, and, he, and he ordains, for example, whatever he, he purposes or something like that. And this always is understood as expression of this deterministic, predestined, you know, uh, plan of God which happens regardless. That's the way we understand it. When you read the writings of the Bible, it is very clear that this statement means exactly the opposite. Even this statement, Yaf that the first part refers to divine revelation. Yaf from the word mashiyat, primal will, will. And the second one, refers to the concept of erade. 
I usually translate this uh, in, in, uh, in logos and civilization or gate of the heart as determination, but it has different uh, translations. And erade is free choice of humanity, according to the writings of the Bible. That's the way, according to the writings of the Bible, everything happens. Everything happens by the interaction of the mashiyat and erade, of the will of God and receptivity and choice of the humanity. This is his universal principle for everything that happens. And it is the fundamental idea that every aspect of the ideas of the Bab, everything that he has said, all goes back to this. For that reason, when you understand this, it's amazing the degree of consistency and unity and interconnectedness which exists in all the writings of the Bab, anything that he discusses. I'll talk about these things in, in uh, some of them in the next sessions. I already have talked a lot, so I, I try to, uh, to um, s um, bring that to a uh, closure uh, in a few minutes. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, for uh, optimistic, happy, joyful, vision of Shoghi Afandi about history, history of the Baha'i faith, to be realized, namely the heroic age would not be followed by age of despair and betrayal, those bloods and those realized. Um, it is uh, necessary that in addition with the divine will and divine effulgence and divine guidance, we also act and would feel in certain ways. Um, it is in the writings that even if we don't act, you know, new generations would be created or uh, natural objects in the world would be raised, but in any case, that also becomes new types of human beings to act. Always activities of we human beings become part of this trauma. If not us, new um, types of creation has, has to take action for realization of, of those things. It's not a predeterministic thing, we are part of this interaction uh, of text and um, and uh, uh, context. I finish uh, this. So I just wanted to say, you know, text and context in the Baha'i heroic age. What I mean by this title and the categories within this title in general, um, but. Um, uh, next time that we see each other, I start to talk about text and context in terms of the writings of the Bob, some, some of them. Um, but I finish this with just this reference because we talked about Shoghi Afandi's conception of, of history, that the way Shoghi Afandi discusses history, and this is a great example of that, this division of heroic, um, uh, apostolic, formative, and and the golden age, what you see in his conception of history is this absolutely spiritual awareness. That is actually the heart of everything that the Bob has, has written. I'll talk about this next time that we'll see each other. The Bob is just intoxicated with God. Everything is spiritualized. He just sees everything in a spiritual fashion. When you read the writings of the Bab, you have this uh, feeling that the Bab is sitting in a particular situation in which he looks at everything in this world from the point of view of the celestial realms, from Jabarut or Lahut or something like that. So everything is, he sees the same thing that you and I see, but he interprets that, understands that in a spiritual fashion. In everything, he sees the signs of God. Everything. That's the way all the writings of the Bible are like that. 
And of course, he wants to create a new civilization which is based upon, upon that. Namely, we all see each other as reflections of God. The way we act towards each other would be on that basis. The way social order, economic, political, cultural institutions are designed, created, would be based upon that spiritual awareness. It's a very different vision, and it's a very beautiful vision. When you read the writings of Shoghi Afendi, you see that same spirit take, taking also a sociological and you know, historical analysis. But it, it is the same thing. When Shoghi Afendi talks about history, your uh, understanding history in terms of the dynamics of the presence of God. Everything that he does is that way. The title of his work of history, God Passes By, is such this beautiful expression of that same principle. God Passes By was a title that he chose among the suggestions which were made to the Shoghi Afendi, and immediately he chose this particular one, God Passes By, for his work of history. What this word God passes by mean? It was so difficult that I remember when this was translated into Persian, they, they used the word Karne Badi, which means new century, for God passes by, new century. Of course, it was, one, it was written, published exactly 100 years after 1844, so in, in a sense that was correct, and also the Persian tablet that Guardian wrote, for that same occasion, it's called Lohe Karn, the tablet of century. And so it's, it's actually a very good choice, Karn Badi, the new century for that. However, it has nothing to do with God passes by. It's very hard to find a word in Persian or in Arabic to find it. However, it's not that difficult. God passes by is a very old, uh, spiritually very significant idea in the Old Testament. It is directly taken from the Old Testament, from Torah. And Torah is filled with discussion of this. The original Hebrew word, for a brief period of time I, I went and I, I studied Hebrew. We were going for four months to Haifa and I thought that I have to learn Hebrew uh, before going to, to there. And, I learned the Hebrew of Torah, really. And uh, when, I, when we went to Haifa, I could read Torah and understand it independently, 60% of that, something like that. It was a very beautiful time. Then I went to Haifa and nobody was speaking uh, Hebrew. I, I forgot the whole thing and it was followed. And now I have forgotten all those things that I learned. But when I was reading Torah, uh, lots of very interesting things came up, and including this frequent discussion of God passing by by the people. Moses brings people from slavery from Egypt, and during this long journey, lots of things happen. But God becomes present. God descends and comes to the community and walks with the people, passes by. And the word that is used in Hebrew, if I remember the, the root of that is ebar, which in Arabic becomes abara, uh, or obur, we say obur, God obur kad, or this one obur kad, passed by. The, the exact word in Hebrew is ebar. But I have forgotten my Hebrew, so I, I can't tell you the exact, details of uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew expressions of that. So, for example, frequently uh, the, uh, the people are uh, standing in a sort of row and God comes and passes by them. Uh, or frequently God comes to the community and people have interaction with God. And so all these things 
uh, and it's not once or twice uh, or three times in, in Torah. Frequently there is this talk of God coming to the people, presence of God among the people, interaction of God with the people, and the fact that he comes and walks besides them. God passes by is reference to that. Namely, it's a new uh, spiritual stage that God also has come now and is acting in the history. He's the main actor. And so this is reference to the, a new civilization, which is going to be a spiritual civilization. A civilization in which consciousness of our spiritual reality becomes the foundation and the essence and the identity of, of everything. Whatever Shogi Afandi discusses uh, in terms of dynamics of Baha'i history or events in the world and so on are all related to, to, to this uh, absolutely spiritual awareness uh, of, of guardian, of the presence of God, and this history having meaning, history having a purpose, history having a direction, and history based upon ultimately the spiritual reality and character uh, of the people. Anyway, I, um, I uh, stop at this moment and uh, I didn't discuss anything really substantive in terms of any particular text or any particular context. Uh, those things will begin next time that we see each other in, in two weeks. Probably I'll start with discussion of the way the Bob would interpret uh, different texts. The first major works of the Bab are interpretive writings. He writes commentary on Quranic Surah of Joseph, for example. Mullah Hussein was there when it started. Or even before his declaration, he wrote commentary on the Surah of Cow. Or he writes commentary on the Surah of Kosar, or lots of. Sometimes he writes a commentary on a particular verse, sometimes a whole chapter, and so he has a lot of these things. That is a, the first dominant stage of the writings of, of, of the Bab. And these writings are very frequently are misunderstood, and uh, it's really sad the way that they, they are not understood. Um, and the reason for that is that the logic of interpretation of the Bab is not understood. When uh, we understand his, his logic of interpretation, his logic of what, what is called hermeneutics about these things, then you see that all these works are connected, all of them then make sense, the way he discusses everything in this text, are not a set of fragmented, chaotic, arbitrary things. This is the way Edward Brown understood. Even Dennis McCune understood uh, the interpretive writings of the Bob, because the logic of interpretation is not understood, and therefore everything seems to be arbitrary. All the interpretations seem to be arbitrary and chaotic, and this one is not related to this one, this one is not related to that one. It seems very strange that he takes, for instance, letters and interprets them and so on. We have to understand what is his logic of interpretation. My next uh, uh, session would be devoted to that, and in that context I hope that I would emphasize his first works, the commentary on the Surah of Joseph.